Hey everybody, welcome to Amy Nolte Music. You've probably heard about a million instrumental solos in your life. M maybe not so much in current music, like in the top 40, but all the way through the 90s, there's a good chance that about two thirds of the way through a song, you were gonna hear somebody take a solo. There's a tradition of improvising in music that goes back several centuries. Bach was an amazing improviser, for example. But the art of the solo really began to be developed during the jazz age, when people began to be virtuosos on their instrument, not just recreating difficult passages that somebody else had written, but creating their own mini compositions right there in the moment, spontaneously within songs. Sometimes when I give talks about jazz, I like to make sure that people understand what taking a solo really means. That it's largely about improvising, but it doesn't just mean taking whatever notes you happen to be feeling at the time and playing them in the moment. There's more to it than that. Now this tradition of taking a solo made its way out of jazz and into country music, rock music, soul music, pop music, pretty much any popular music you can think of as the 20th century progressed. And today I wanna to take some of the most epic guitar solos ever and tell you what goes on behind them. My friend Jason Neubauer is helping me out today. I asked him if he could recreate to the best of his ability six amazing guitar solos that were basically suggested to me by a poll that I took on my music Facebook page. Thank you everyone for those. Jason was up to the challenge. He always is. Please follow Jason Neubauer on his Instagram, his Facebook, his YouTube channel, and everything that he does. He's an amazing musician up in New York State. And you can also check out the other duets that he and I have done together on my channel. Every song has a form. Sometimes it can be 32 bars long. Sometimes a song can be 12 bars long. All songs have chords within that form. Some kind of harmony that happens is like a groundwork for the melody. A quick example of this is for me to use the chords to happy birthday. Now I know the chords to happy birthday. I know how they sound. I know what order they come in. I know how long each one of them lasts. So theoretically, I should be able to just play the chords to happy birthday and make up my own melody on the spot, my solo. Put it simply, the thing that I was doing is to just keep track of the chords in my mind, and as they happen, I played strong chord tones on each of those chords so that you could feel that I was a part of that harmony as it was happening. People don't necessarily realize that when a solo happens, like a shredding guitar solo in rock music, that they're not just playing whatever they're feeling in the moment, they're adhering to the form of the song. They know what the chords are. They're playing strong tones of those chords to take you on a journey through the harmony. Lash from Guns N' Roses knew the importance of placing strong chord tones at the beginning of new chords. Let's listen to Jason recreate part of Slash's solo on November Rain.
Now, one of the strongest chord tones I can think of is the three, the third degree of the scale or the second or the middle note of the chord that gets played. It's very strong. It's what makes the chord either major or minor. And Slash uses the three all the time on this solo. In fact, let's count how many times Slash lands on the three as the new chord happens. nine times. Just for kicks, what would happen if we took Slash's solo and displaced it with the harmony? So what if I start the backing track and one bar later I start Slash's solo so that the harmony he was meant to be playing over happens but he doesn't actually start playing until the next chord? So even though this solo all happens in the key of B, if it's off by a bar you can tell that it just doesn't work because He's not following the groundwork that's laid by the form of the song in this imaginary situation that I'm setting up. Let's listen to Jason play another one of my favorite guitar solos. Something by George Harrison of the Beatles. I just want to say that if this melody had been the melody to something, it might have worked. It might have still been a hit. George Harrison's melody that he came up with to play over these chords at this point in time is so beautiful that I think, I think it stands alone. I think it could be its own thing. It's so nice. And I just wanted to say about this solo that that is such a big part of taking a solo is that your melody is strong. Slash's example was mm, just another perfect one. You can sing the melody just like it's the song. I mean, it starts and I think everybody who knows this song well could probably hum the melody along and that's huge. Just for kicks, I think I'll try playing my own melody over the chords of something and see how I stack up against George. <laughs> Brian May is also a great example of how to create your own amazing standalone melody over a set of chord changes on Bohemian Rhapsody. He 
thought about it in a slightly different way than Slash did in November Rain, though. Instead of landing on the third of many, many chords, Brian May actually lands on the one. Let's do the same exact thing and count as Brian May hits the one of several of these chords over Bohemian Rhapsody. Seven times. I actually learned a lot by analyzing this solo. If you're, you know, a guitar teacher or any kind of teacher teaching somebody to improvise, it's not a bad idea to just give them the challenge to start on the root of every single chord and see what they come up with. Let's listen to Jason play Beat It again. This section of the song is in E flat minor. It also goes down to D flat major, B flat major occasionally, but mostly it sits on E flat minor. Now, it's so interesting that Eddie Van Halen came in to record this for Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson, and he kind of did it incognito. He didn't take any money for the session. He didn't get credit on the track. Reportedly, he just took a case of beer and asked that Michael Jackson show him some dance moves. Whew. So cool. Now the section they wanted him to improvise over when he came in was just one chord. I assume that it's E flat minor, but he said there was nowhere to go with it. it. He said there was no harmony and he needed some harmony. So I think he asked to just solo over the verse section. You know, they told him, don't you ever come around here, all of that part. And it gives motion to what he was doing. And he was a genius to know that, to know that his, the kind of crazy ripping solo that he wanted to take needed to be driven forward by some chord changes. Now you might think that this solo is so amazing that you could put it over any other song and it would sound just as ripping. It's, I want to tell you is that's not, that's not how it is, but just for fun, I'll put it over a backing track of one of the songs we're going to talk about in a second, the Sultans of Swing and just see how it stands up. <laughs> I'm sorry I did that to you. Sometimes a great solo isn't just making your own melody over a set of chord changes. It can be finding a group of notes and a pattern to play them in, a group of notes that fits over a particular chord and just playing them from the depths of your soul while something amazing comes out. I really think that, I mean, although Eddie Van Halen's solo had real poignant moments of epic melody, that's a lot what he did right here, was just found some, uh, groups of notes and a way to latch onto them and play them with so much heart. And just for fun, I'm gonna take my own solo over Beat It. We'll see how it goes. <laughs>
Mark Knopfler's solo on Sultans of Swing is another amazing example of how to make your own super memorable melody over a set of chord changes. just like George Harrison did over something. But as you just heard, there are sections where if you were singing along with this solo, you would start to sound silly because of how fast the notes get. So this is a combination of a soaring melody mixed with technical shredding sections that make this one of the best guitar solos ever taken, I think. The End by the Beatles has a section at the end of it that does something different than anything else we've talked about yet today. I want Jason to play that for you. Now, what happened on the end is that there was this idea that Paul and George and John would all take turns soloing, so one after the other in that order over and over again. Now, let's hear Jason play it. He's gonna play like he's all three of them, because he can. This section of the song is a vamp. A vamp is usually two chords that happen and repeat over and over and over and over and over again. It can also be one chord, maybe it could be three chords, maybe even four, but usually it's two, kind of like uh, how Carlos Santana soloed over Oye Como Va. <laughs> It's two chords also on the end. We're talking about A minor and D, or a 2-5 in the key of G. Soloing over two chords that repeat and repeat and repeat like this can seem constricting, but it can actually give a kind of freedom that you can't find when you have all those chords to keep to as a song progresses. You know, just having two chords can be the opposite of constricting. It can be a lot of freedom. One of the best examples I can think of of this kind of freedom over a vamp is when the John Coltrane Quartet recorded their version of My Favorite Things. <laughs> Sometimes within the confines of just two chords, so much creativity can happen that it just blows your mind. Thanks for taking a look at what it actually means to take a shredding solo with me. Much thanks to my friend Jason Neubauer. Thank you guys for watching. Please click the like button, click the subscribe button. Check me out on Nebula if you want. And I'll see you next time on Amy Nolte Music.